This is Acoustic Theory Basics for Fisheries Sampling. This presentation will be a quick overview of acoustic theory as it relates to fishery sampling. There certainly is a lot to go over on the topic in general, so this will be a quick crash course of the basics. So a description of sound waves in water. Sound propagation can be pictured as a wave of relative energy of fixed wavelength and decreasing amplitude moving through an elastic medium. Wave peaks represent areas of compression and troughs represent areas of rarefaction. The top figure shows level of compression as a function of distance, with the horizontal line being undisturbed. The bottom figure is a representation of matter. Each curved line can be thought of as where particles are close together, and the areas where the curved lines are far apart is where the medium is rarefied. This is a visual of the pulse of acoustic energy. This is a longitudinal wave, or compression wave, since the mechanical particles that make up the medium of the wave move back and forth in the direction of the wave, causing compression and rarefaction. The other type of wave is a transverse wave, where the particles of the medium move perpendicularly to the movement of the wave. Also known as a shear wave, this is how rippling on a pond works. If you consider that the intersection of where vertical and horizontal lines represent particles of the medium, you'll note that while the actual wave travels through the medium, the particles only move about an equilibrium point. Wavelength is the distance that a periodic wave covers from one point in its cycle to the next identical point, such as peak to peak or trough to trough. Quantitatively, the wavelength of sound is defined as the speed of sound in the medium over its frequency. You can see that the amplitude of the wave is its maximum value. As seen in the slide before this, this is the difference between undisturbed medium and where the compression was at its highest. The speed of sound in water is not constant. It is a function of temperature, salinity, and pressure. Here is a simplified model of sound speed in water. As you can see, there are still complex relationships. The plot shows temperature versus sound speed at varying levels of salinity. This is one of the contributing factors to wavelength. Frequency is how many wavelengths pass by a point in some unit time as it, and is measured in hertz. In the previous slide, it is the amount of compression peaks passing through a point in one second. This image shows examples of waves with varying frequencies, the red line having the lowest frequency and the violet line having the highest. Frequency, as used in acoustical systems, can vary greatly. Generally, a sound pulse is created by deflecting a mechanical element in a hydrophone. The rate at which this element is deflected back and forth alters the frequency of the created acoustic wave, while the magnitude of its deflection alters the amplitude of the wave. For different purposes, many different frequencies are used. You can see here things that require deeper penetration, such as seismic and sub-bottom profiling, use lower frequencies, while applications requiring high resolution, such as acoustical imaging and acoustical microscopy, use higher frequencies. You'll also note that when the speed of sound is constant, there is a one-to-one -one relationship between wavelength and frequency, as shown in the equation on a previous slide. In terms of scientific echo sounding, a range around 200 kilohertz is common for use. With different applications of different frequency ranges, there are advantages and disadvantages to either. Some advantages of high acoustical frequency include the physical size of the transducer will be smaller for a given beam width. This means easier installations, more mobile devices, and generally less expensive components. The survey platform required for handling smaller devices does not have to be as robust as is required for arrays that can be meters across. Also, the minimum size of an object that can be detected increases with increasing frequency. This means being able to resolve clusters of fish into separate fish instead of school masses compared to using a lower frequency. Some disadvantages of high acoustical frequency include absorption being greater at higher frequencies. This means that overall range is decreased as frequency increases due to signal to noise ratios getting too low. Higher frequency acoustics require higher driving power to compensate for this. Just as higher frequencies can resolve smaller objects, smaller objects interact and reflect acoustics at higher frequencies. This means that noise is introduced into measurements by smaller particles in turbulent, bubbly water. 
So here is a summary of acoustic properties affected by frequency. The plot's horizontal axis is kilohertz, with frequency ranges suited to detecting schools, individual fish, and plankton indicated. Note that higher frequency acoustics are better suited to smaller objects, and vice versa. The plot's left vertical axis indicates range. Note that the higher the frequency, the shorter the maximum range for detection gets. Depending on the type of target, different frequencies, frequencies should be used accordingly. Timing is an important measurement on two-way acoustical systems. This slide shows two figures. Figure A is a diagram of what a typical transducer installation may look like at a dam, with two fish crossing its detection area. Fish 1 has a trajectory that is perpendicular to the acoustical beam, while Fish 2 has some oblique trajectory angle. Figure B shows what, that, what those two fish would look like on an echogram as measured by the transducer. Fish 1 shows as being an equal distance from the hydrophone at all times because it is not changing its range with relationship to, to the device, just its orientation. Fish 2 is changing its range and orientation, and as such has the same pattern as a line intersecting a circle. You'll note that if most of your readings show a trajectory as exemplified by Fish 2, you might have a canting of your transducer. This is not an ideal situation. The relationship between range r and travel time t is t equals 2 times r over c, where c is the velocity of sound in water. You'll note that this complicated to measure and calculate value of sound speed is extremely important in acoustic engineering. The main thing being measured when using any sort of two-way system is timing which is a function of speed and distance. So not only is the speed of sound important to understanding wavelength and frequency, but it is crucial for timing measurements. The transmitted acoustic pulse has its own characteristics. Here, figure A shows an ideal situation for detecting fish. Figure B shows the signal originally transmitted by the transducer. The signal has some pulse length. The return signal at the transducer shows the echo of the original signal from fish 1 at a return time, and then the echo of the same pulse from fish 2 at the later time. As long as these pulses don't intersect, the two fish can be resolved. This is what's known as target resolution. Target resolution is a function of distance between targets, delta r, the speed of sound, c, and the pulse length, tau. The time between echoes from two targets must be greater than the pulse length, specifically delta r equals c tau over 2, where time to receive echo is 2 range over c. This is an example of where targets are in too narrow of a band to be resolved. All the fish here are in such a tight range from the transducer that the return echo of a single pulse is overlapped and indistinguishable. Also shown on this graph is what is known as the dead zone or shadow zone. The shadow zone is the range at the bottom of the insonified area where the center of the spherically radiating pulse meets the bottom and the edges of the insonified area do not. Because of this, the outer edges of the beam will be masked by the hard return of the center. This is the shadow zone. So there is an obvious advantage to shorter pulse lengths. The ability to resolve objects that are closer together increases. So why not make the pulse length minuscule? Well, the disadvantages of shorter pulse length include, for one, converting the analog pulse received to a digital sample for recording is made more difficult as the pulse length gets smaller. And the effect noise has on an acoustic pulse is increase as its pulse length is decreased. So let's talk about measurements of acoustic signals. An acoustic wave is a pressure wave and their level is measured in micropascals. One micropascal is one millionth of a newton per square meter. The, the output of an echo sounder is an electrical signal measured in volts. Acoustic levels are usually specified in logarithmic ratios called decibels, dB. So a pressure in dB 
is 20 log of the pressure. So for instance, 1000 micropascals is the same as 20 log 1000. You'll note that if the pressure of one wave is twice the pressure of another, then there is a 6 dB difference between the two waves. If a pressure of one wave is 10 times pre the pressure of another, the dB difference is 20 decibels. And if the pressure of one wave is 100 times another, then the dB di difference is 40 decibels. So as I mentioned, a decibel is a logarithmic ratio of values. This is a convenient way to handle a varying magnitude of values. For an intensity, 10 log the intensity over a reference intensity is its, va is its decibel value. For pressure, since intensity is related to pressure by pressure squared, the equation is 20 log pressure over some reference pressure. So for example, if a reference pressure is 1 micropascal, then a pressure wave of 100,000 micropascals becomes 20 log 100,000 over 1, or 100 dB with reference to 1 micropascal. The acoustic level of an echo is the function of the acoustic size of the fish. The measure of the acoustic size of a fish is the backscattering cross-section. The corresponding measure of acoustic size in dB is the target strength, or TS. Typical values for TS for fish are between minus 20 dB and minus 60 dB. The acoustic size is related to the physical size of the fish. The received acoustic intensity depends on both the backscattering cross-section and the beam pattern factor. The effect of the beam pattern must be removed from the echo level to determine the backscattering cross-section. This is done automatically in HTI systems. The direct measuring approach is isolate echoes from single fish, measure the beam pattern factor, compensate for the beam pattern factor, and apply the proper scale factor. Here is a diagram of a fish with different target strength values based on the aspect of a fish. Here is an empirical relationship to relate fish size with target strength. This was developed by Love in 1971 and is the usual go-to comparison between target strength and fish length. The equation is seen above. This is useful for the interpretation of how a measurement relates to the size of the fish being measured. On top of differences in size and orientation leading to different signal returns, transducers all have unique beam forming patterns. This is due to the orientation of the transducer and because the transducer head is finite affecting a three-dimensional area. This means that objects in different sections of a detectable range of a transducer have different signal returns. This compensation is known as one-way beam pattern factor. It is a function of the angle that the target makes with the acoustic axis of the transducer. For a split beam, the target location is specified by angles in perpendicular plane. This describes the one-way loss in signal intensity due to the angle of the target from the acoustic axis. To summarize, the acoustic level is highest in the center of the beam along the acoustic axis. The received response of a transducer is also greatest along the acoustic axis. Since both the transmit and the receive response of the transducer decrease with the angle off axis, the echo return from a given size fish will decrease as the fish moves away from the axis of the beam. Therefore, signal level depends on both the acoustic size of the fish and its position in the beam. In HTI systems, this beam pattern factor is automatically compensated for. Here is an example of the target strength of a single target at different beam angles. You can see that as the angle the target makes with the transducer increases, the target strength decreases. So here are a few other things that reduce an acoustical signal. First, we have absorption. Absorption is the reduction of the acoustic level due to local heating in the propagating sound wave. Absorption loss 
in decibels is proportional to the range. Absorption loss in decibel increases as a function of the square of the frequency. Absorption is much higher in salt water than fresh water. For frequencies and ranges used in most fresh water applications, the effects of absorption can be ignored. Here are two graphs showing the effect absorption has on an acoustic pulse. The mathematical model for one-way absorption loss is the absorption coefficient times the range, and two-way absorption loss is the absorption coefficient times twice the range. Another reduction in signal is caused by spreading loss. A certain amount of energy is put into the water by the transducer. As the signal moves away from the source, it spreads out in all directions equally. All of the energy from the pulse is contained in the spherical com compression wave. However, the area that, that compression wave covers gets larger as the range from the source get gets larger. As previously mentioned, pressure is force over area, so the pressure drops. As the surface area of a sphere goes as r squared, therefore too the spreading loss goes as range squared. This range dependent spreading loss is compensated for by the echo sounder TVG. Here is a representation of the increasing area of a sound wave containing the same amount of energy. Pressure decreases as 1 over the distance from the source. This geometrical spreading is well understood and compensated for in an HTI echo sounder system. The one-way transmission loss is described as 20 log the range, while two-way loss is described by 40 log range. So here is how geometrical spreading and absorption affect transmission loss. You'll note that even at higher frequencies, absorption is negligible in the ranges used for acoustic echo sound. So this brings us to the acoustic equation. This is an equation encompassing all of the factors that affect a signal transmitted and then received by a transducer and describes the voltage measured. Its factors are SL, the transducer source level, G sub 1, the through system gain at 1 meter, TS, the target strength, capital B, the one-way beam pattern factor, 40 log R, two-way transmission loss at range R, alpha, the absorption coefficient, GTVG, the time varied gain, 20 or 40 log R depending on the system, and RG, the added system receiver gain. The only factors in this equation we have not discussed so far are the through system gain and the source level of the instrument. Both the through system gain and the source level are derived during calibration procedures from the manufacturer. Here is an example of a calibration report of those values. The source level is estimated relative to a standard transducer at a calibration facility. The receiving sensitivity is also estimated relative to a standard transducer at the calibration facility. HTI does both of these calibrations and recommends a yearly recalibration. However, if great care is taken during sphere calibrations in the field, yearly calibrations at HTI may not be required. So an example of the acoustic equation using typical values is shown here. With a frequency of 120 kilohertz, a target range of 100 meters, a water temperature of 10 degrees Celsius, and a salinity of 35 parts per million. The values here are the factors that go into the voltage out of the echo sounder. What this means is that with a return signal of 0.323 volts, your target has a target strength of minus 42 dB. This information can be used to relate the target strength to the size of the fish. Thank you for following with the Acoustic Theory Basics for Fisheries Sampling.